The psalmist in Psalm 138 says, I will give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Well, let's join together in singing a version of that psalm. You'll find it at number 138 in our blue books. I'll praise you, Lord, with heart content and joyful. Before the world, I'll tell your righteous ways. Number 138. Well, as we sit together, we join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, it is with hearts full of joy that we bow before you, joy and gladness in your extraordinary faithfulness, your steadfast, your unshrinking love towards us, your people. You have indeed exalted above all things your name and your word. And therefore, Lord, it is who you are that will shape this universe for all eternity. You have set your timeless kingdom to be forever the home of glory. And so all earthly powers will one day at last acknowledge you, acknowledge your might, marvel at your glory. But Lord, how we thank you that even now we may call upon you as Father, that you who sit so high and exalted, that you stoop to look upon the lowly, that you touch us by your marvelous saving grace. 
grace that lifts us up, that restores us, that is drawing us home to you so that we will at last be with you forever and ever, to be your children, to be those you delight in, those that you call your own. Lord, this wonderful knowledge lights up our lives day by day and week by week, even in the midst of struggles, of many sorrows, many sadnesses that still we do face in this world. But to know that whatever else may cease, that your mercy, that your love towards us will never cease. This, Lord, is a light in the darkness to our lives. And so, Lord, we pray that as we gather together this morning in the name of Jesus, your Son, seeking your face, seeking the assurance of your love and your grace, we pray that you would fill us afresh with the knowledge of your nearness and of your gracious goodness to us. Teach us more, Lord, we pray, of your ways that you might fulfill in us, even now, with all our many sins, all our many failings, that you may fulfill in us more and more your mighty purposes, that we should be a people who glorify you through Jesus Christ, your perfect and holy Son, that his name may be great, and that to him might be the praise and the glory of all this world. So, Lord, hear us, we pray in this, our morning prayer. Heed us and answer us. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> well, let me uh, welcome you very warmly to our fellowship here this morning, and uh, a particular welcome if you're here with us visiting, uh, or if it's your first time with us here at the Tron. We're always glad to welcome visitors and we hope we'll have a chance to meet you and greet you after the service. Uh, there are notice sheets here, which I think you should have received on the way in. I'm not going to go through them uh, other than just to point out, uh, obviously, we have our news of our uh, mission partners, Scott and Knock Murray, with some details there for our prayers, particularly this month, and uh, I'm sure you want to make use of those. There are details on the inside about various events coming up this week and in the future, and I'd ask you to uh, peruse those and to Use them uh, for your prayers as we pray together as a fellowship. And then you'll see on the uh, panel about today that we meet again this evening. Do come and join us tonight at 6.30. Edward Lobb is to be beginning a new series in the book of Judges, and uh, we very much look forward uh, to that and to sharing fellowship together at 6.30. The end of our service this morning, we gather around the Lord's table. Uh, I'll be leading communion from downstairs but uh, we'll all be gathered around uh, the Lord's table together. We invite you, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, consider yourselves to be part of His church, whether you're in fellowship with us here or in another place, you're welcome to join us uh, at the Lord's table if He is indeed your Lord and Savior. Well, I'll leave you to read these, as I said, but we're going to turn now to our reading this morning, which is in 1 Peter chapter 4. If you have one of the church Bibles, it's page 1016. And we're continuing our studies in this first letter of Peter, and reading once again chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. We're concentrating this morning on the second half of this section, but we'll read verses 1 to 11. So Peter says, "'Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking.'" For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased, has done with sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles, the pagan world, wants to do, living in sensuality and passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. But this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, that though judged in the flesh according to man, they may live by the Spirit according to God. The end of all things 
is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show your hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> well, now we have a few moments of quiet as our offerings for the Lord's work are received. You might like to meditate further on these words that we've just read, or pray quietly for those in need at this time. But as we do that, in the quiet, our offerings will be received. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come before you and as we acknowledge these gifts that we bring and add them to all the giving of this fellowship in so many ways, we ask, Lord, that you would take what we have and what we offer to you and use it that the name of Christ may indeed be glorified, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in this world. As we look at the world, O oh God, our hearts are so often not at peace. As we look at the world of men and we fear, we fear for the exercise of power and authority that seems so often to lead to destruction, to war, to the strife that is so quickly aroused between men and between nations. We lift before you, Lord, the situation unfolding uh, day by day and even hour by hour in Eastern Europe at this time, in Ukraine and in Crimea. We think of the rising heat of the rhetoric between the Russian president and the President of the United States and the heads of government in Europe and our own nation. We fear, Lord, for that land. We fear for its people. And we know that we 
have so little power, so little influence, and seem so helpless in the face of these great forces of history and of nations rising against nation. But Lord, we come before you this morning acknowledging that we know that you are the God of heaven, that you are the ultimate power, that no man in this world has power except by your command, by your permission, and by your authority. And so we pray for your restraint upon the hearts of men, upon the heat of anger that rises so quickly, that you would bring through wisdom, through farsightedness, through a desire genuinely for peace, you would bring restraint to the forces at work in that part of the world today. We pray, Lord, for the people of that nation, no doubt watching things unfolding as we do around the world and feeling great fear and trepidation, wondering what the future holds, wondering if further violence and bloodshed and even open warfare is to erupt in their midst. Have mercy, Lord, we pray. Bring peace to bear, we ask humbly. But, Lord, we know that this whole world is a world riven apart by the ravages of sin, by the evil that is in the heart of man, by the forces that are within us so deep and so natural to us as human beings in our fallen state. And we know our own weakness to overcome these. We know, Lord, that only the gospel of your grace and mercy can transform the human heart. We know that, therefore, the greatest need for our world, for its nations, for its governments and peoples, is for the work of grace to take place in human hearts, men and women and boys and girls, all over this world. We thank you, Lord, that all over this world today, where the name of Jesus is being proclaimed, there are men and women, boys and girls from every tribe and nation, people who are being brought together <clears throat> in bonds of extraordinary conflict-quenching love, as together they name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and animosities and hatreds are being put aside, and the power of your forgiveness, your mercy, your grace is being seen in the flesh, in this world, in communities being shaped by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do bring before you, Lord, very especially this morning, Scott and Nock Murray and their colleagues and others working at the River Kwai Christian Hospital there on the border of Thailand and Burma. We thank you for the many opportunities that they have to be a beacon of light, not only in a medical way to help and to heal so many, but brightly shining the beacon of the gospel of Christ to all who come within the bounds of that hospital. We thank you, Lord, for the evangelists who work there, for those who make Jesus Christ known, for the many hundreds who week by week come for bodily healing, but find also the message of eternal healing, of everlasting hope, of light and of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we pray that your hand would be upon them and their work there, both them and their family, their children at Chiang Mai in school. We pray for your blessing on them, encouragement to them. May they see at your hand great and marvelous things happening through their lives and through the message also of their lips as they speak of Jesus, even as they work for him to show his love. And so, Lord, our prayer for ourselves is the same, that you, through speaking your words of grace and of love and of power to us, that you would be shaping us to be a people who shed the light of the Lord Jesus Christ abroad from our lips and from our lives also. Help us, Lord, in being a people unsullied by the sin of this world, 
be shining brightly for Jesus Christ, that all who come among us, that all who have contact with us here and in the many places in this city throughout the week where we work, where we make our lives and rub shoulders with others, that they would see, even in us, with all our faults, with all our many failings of which we are only too conscious, but nevertheless see, shining brightly, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the great healer, the great lover, the one who comes to all who will open their hearts to bring the light of the gospel of life that saves and transforms and changes forever. So, Lord, as we come to your word this morning, speak to us, we pray. Feed us with your holy word that we might be shaped more into your likeness so that through Jesus Christ, our God might be glorified forever and ever. Amen. Well, as we come to God's Word, we sing the hymn on the screen, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your Holy Word. Well, if you turn with me to First Peter chapter 4, and uh, we're going to be looking at that together this morning. 
We've seen in this letter that uh, Peter's message about real Christianity for the real church in the real world is at the same time both a glorious vision and a great challenge. He tells us that we are a people with a divine calling. Chapter 2, verse 9 says, We're a chosen race, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that we might proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. A glorious calling to an eternal glory in Jesus our Lord. And yet, uh, at the same time, a deeply challenging calling. Because in this world, our calling is fulfilled as we follow inescapably in the path of our Lord Jesus Christ in this world. And his road to glory that he trod was, of course, the road to Calvary. So chapter 2, verse 21, "'For to this you have been called,' says Peter, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an exact pattern that you might follow in his steps. We too, he means, will always be strangers and aliens on this earth. We'll be outsiders to the culture around us. And therefore, the pressure to conform and to compromise will be very, very great. The pressure to silence our message about the Lord Jesus. But no, says Peter, we are to go on speaking for Jesus. We are to go on shining for Jesus, even though it might mean suffering unjustly for doing good. We're not, he says, to shrink back into silence, however hostile the response of the world might be. And nor, as we saw last time, are we to slip back into sin. That's so easy to do when the whole culture around us wants us to do what it does, wants us to think what it thinks. And we saw last time in chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, that the pressure to conform is very great. Verse 4, people can't understand us when we think differently, and so they will malign us. And that's hard, isn't it? That hurts, because Christians are human too. And it's very hard to be considered oddities in this world, even dangerous oddities. And Peter says the only way not to slip back is to be armed. Chapter 4, verse 1, armed with the saving pattern of Christ, resolved to suffer if need be rather than to sin. And armed also with the strengthening perspective of Christian faith that reminds us that it is not man who has the last word, not ever. It's God himself, verse 5. He will judge all people, the living and the dead. So don't sink. We're to be unsullied in this world of sin. But of course, sin is not just a problem that pressurizes us from the outside, from the world round about us. Sadly, since we Christians are also sinners by nature, it's a problem that very often threatens us from inside the church itself. And you'll see that verses 7 to 11, Peter's focus moves from the sins of the flesh, you might say, to the sins of the fellowship. And these also we are to be armed against, just as we're to arm our minds with right thinking, says verse 1, the mind of Christ. So also, we are to arm ourselves, verse 7, with right minds, armed against compromise with the world, yes, but self-controlled, sober minds to arm us against conflict in the church. And that's the focus in these verses we're looking at today. Verses 1 to 6 was about not slipping back into sensuality in our personal life in the midst of a sinful culture. And verses 7 to 11 here are about not slipping back into selfishness in our corporate life amid the sinful church. And Peter is very realistic, isn't he, about the reality, about the problem of sin within congregations. Look at verse 8. He says we're going to have to deal in the church with a multitude of sin in amongst one another. That's pretty realistic, isn't it? See, this is a letter about life in the real world, not some kind of fantasy land where everything in the garden is rosy. Peter knows that the natural tendency 
in our churches is not going to be towards the selflessness that builds up the church, but towards selfishness that breeds friction in the church, towards grumbling, as he says in verse 9, grabbing for ourselves, not generosity and giving to others. That's why there's no command anywhere in the New Testament, at least in my Bible, about learning how to love ourselves more. Is that in your Bible? I heard on the radio the other day that, um, that song from the 70s that I think it was uh, Whitney Houston had a great hit with in the 1980s, The Greatest Love of All. Remember it? I was struck by the words, the greatest love of all is happening to me. I find the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Well, that really rather summed up the spirit of the 1980s. No wonder it was a great hit. And my goodness, how absolutely right and how utterly wrong it is, both at the same time, isn't it? Because the greatest love of all is inside of ourselves. It is for ourselves. And it certainly does seem to come easily and naturally, at least to me. But we don't have to learn it, do we? And it's certainly not something to be celebrated. It's that natural, narcissistic self-love that will stop us growing to maturity in life and maturity in the church. It's self-love that breeds the sin that leads to conflict in the church. Not harmony, not serving and enjoying one another, but rather, as Peter says, remember back in chapter 2, verse 1, hypocrisy and slander and envying one another, the very opposite. What we need to learn, says Peter, is to put away all that comes naturally to us in that kind of love. Because by nature, of course, we focus on ourselves and not upon God, not upon one another. And yes, even in the church, that's true. We tend to cherish our gifts for our own gain, not for God's glory, not for serving others. But that's upside down, back to front, totally perverse thinking. Look at verse 10 of our chapter. It's God's varied grace, says Peter. It gives us a share in his church. Verse 11, it's God's word that gives us a share in his gospel message. It's God's strength, he says, that enables us to do anything. And it's God's glory that is the real objective of everything. Loving ourselves, well, yes, that is easy to achieve, far too easy. We don't have to learn that. That comes naturally. But the greatest love, according to Peter, love of God expressed in loving one another, as verse 8 says, that is much harder. We don't find that inside of ourselves. But that is the true calling of the church. And if we're to shine for the Lord Jesus in the world, then we must learn that love. Because it's learning that love that will battle conflict in the church. The conflict that is so destructive to the cause of Christ and the witness to Christ. So how do we not slip back into that natural selfishness that only foments real friction and that conflict that dishonors God in a divided church? Such an important question, isn't it? Just this week, a pastor was telling me of a strong formerly a strong evangelical fellowship that is currently ripping itself apart with conflict, just like that. Such an important question. How are churches to avoid that and instead strive for a real spiritual selflessness that will build real fellowship and a witness that will glorify God in a united church that shines to the world? Well, the answer, according to Peter, is really the same as we saw last time in verses 1 to 6. We are to recognize that this will always be a battle, that it will be a war constantly against sin, and we are to arm ourselves with the right mind, with the mind of Christ himself. So in verse 1, he says, arm yourselves with Christ's way of thinking. And here, verse 7, he says, arm yourselves 
with this right mind, which is a self-controlled and sober mind. That's the mind of Christ. In other words, it's a clear gospel mindset that Peter says. And if you see in verse 7, he says, it understands that the end of all things is near. That is the fulfillment of the purpose of the creation of this world, that it's at hand. And that we, as God's church, that we have a part in this extraordinary purpose for time and for all eternity. And that means that we will live together consciously, focused on serving that purpose that God has given us. In humble, prayerful dependence upon God, and, says Peter, in humble and persistent interdependence on one another. So you see, a clear-thinking, gospel-focused church won't slip back into selfishness and conflict and division if it's a church with a clear priority of prayer, showing its relationship to God the Father is right, and a church with a clear persistence in love that shows that its relationship with one another is right and rightly ordered. That's our calling as the church, says Peter, as God's holy people. Remember in chapter 1, we're to be obedient children, he says, who call God Father, and because of that, we are to be brothers who are growing in love, growing up together into maturity. Prayer to God and love to one another. That's the focus on uh, these two things in this passage. So let's look at them in turn. A clear-thinking gospel church that won't slip back into selfishness, that won't slip into conflict. It'll be marked, first of all, says Peter, with the priority of prayer. Verse 7, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Right relationship with God as our Heavenly Father is shown in humble, prayerful dependence on God in faith. Because that shows that we know that all the power and authority belongs to God and not to us. And so, as one writer puts it, the first resource for living out Christ's victory in the Christian community is the believer's prayer life, or better, even the church's prayer life, because this, uh, like every other command in the New Testament to pray, assumes God's people are praying together as a fellowship, as a church. Prayer is to be the engine room of the church family, is how Angus Maclay puts it in his book. Peter is saying that a church that really understands the gospel, that, that all things, that the world, that history, that our lives, that all things are, are coming to their purpose and their fulfillment when Christ returns, and that that coming is at hand, it could happen any time, a church that really understands that, says Peter, won't be a church that loses its mind. It'll have a clear mind, a sober mind. It won't lurch into fanaticism and fear and all sorts of end times madness, as sometimes churches do. Nor will it lapse into fatalism that, well, the end is nigh, there's nothing we can do about it, just batten down the hatches. No. Clear, self-controlled, gospel thinking results in prayer, according to Peter. Prayerful engagement with this world in concert with God's purposes, eternal purposes for His kingdom in this world. See, it drives us to prayer because we know that God is sovereign, that He is in control of all things, that He can do all things. And crucially, because that means that we know that we are not in control, that we are not God, that we acknowledge all the things that we can't do. And therefore, if, if things happen, then, well, it must be because it's God's doing. And you see, that means that there will be no danger of pride in our midst, doesn't it? Praying together as God's people humbles us because we all have to acknowledge together that what happens in answer to prayer is God's doing and not our doing. And when we receive great answers to prayers, well, we're humbled together because we know it's God. See, when we're under pressure, when there's hostility against our faith, it's very easy to panic. It's easy to think that we, we have to sort everything, that we have to fix everything. 
And sometimes God has to show us our helplessness in order to drive us to prayer, in order to humble us, to, to remind us that we do depend upon Him, that it's not the other way around. God is not dependent on us. That's such an important lesson, isn't it, for us to learn for every Christian, for every church, certainly for every pastor, that the entire future of the universe and God's kingdom is not in our hands. Hallelujah! It's in God's hands. And responsibility for God's kingdom is on His shoulders, not ours. We are not the Messiah. That's such an important thing to be reminded of, is it not? especially if you're in any kind of Christian ministry. We are not God. And you see, when we pray, especially when we pray together, we're reminded of that, aren't we? That we depend upon God, not He on us. And when we pray together, we're all acknowledging that to one another. And it's so important. It's easy also, isn't it, when we're under pressure, to turn, well, to turn to the world's ways, to sinful ways. And to do what Peter tells us not to do, to return evil for evil, to dishonor the Lord, because so often we see that there's no other way to win out. But no, says Peter, steady, clear priority for prayer together as a church reminds us who's in control. That it's God and not us, not even our enemies are in control. It reminds us whom we depend on. We depend upon God and not upon us. And that gives us great confidence and great comfort as together we begin to trust Him. I think we have found that ourselves in recent times, haven't we? Days of of struggle have seen our prayer meeting grow so that our, our hall's packed on a Wednesday evening. And that's a great blessing. But we can always make room for more. Of course we can. There's many more who could still take their part. But I want to encourage us all to take this seriously because because Peter makes it such a priority here for clear-thinking, gospel-minded people. We need that engine room of prayer together, not only all together as a church, but together with others in our small groups, in our home groups, in prayer triplets, and, uh, and so on, to be reminded of who is in control. And of course, don't forget, we need to make sure that there is no impediment to our prayers. We saw that in chapter 3. Husbands, if we're not loving our wives properly, our prayers will be hindered, Peter's plain. And in chapter 3, verse 12, he said that the, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. His ears are open to the righteous. His ear is not open to those who are slipping back into selfishness, into sin, but to those who are acting rightly. Not so much what we pray, but it's, it's what we are that God will hear. He hears our hearts when they cry out in prayer. And that ought to encourage us because there are many folks who feel they're very timid to pray along with others because they feel, well, I, I'm not eloquent. I, I haven't got the right words. But listen, God hears the humblest cry of the humble heart, and it's rightly ordered before Him. Don't forget Luke chapter 18 the story of the publican and the Pharisee praying in the synagogue. It was the humble prayer from the heart of that publican that was heard in heaven, wasn't it? Not the pious platitudes and the length and all of that from the Pharisee. So that's a warning too, isn't it, that that empty words are not heard in heaven. Because real prayer, according to the Bible, is prayer in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of Jesus can't carry unworthy prayer to the throne of God, only prayer that is made in in Jesus' name, only prayer that comes from hearts and minds that are armed with Jesus' way of thinking. But a clear-thinking, gospel-minded church, says Peter, will be marked by the priority of prayer, real prayer, corporate prayer, and humble prayer. And we need God to hear us and to help us greatly if we're going to be marked also by the second thing Peter emphasizes here, the persistence of love, despite being a church where there will be a multitude of sin, according to Peter. That's his focus, isn't it, on the rest of the passage, verses 8 to 11, the persistence of love. 
right relationships with our brothers and sisters are shown, according to Peter, in humble, persistent interdependence on one another in love. Now, no doubt Jesus' words in the Garden of Gethsemane were etched in Peter's mind forever. Remember, he said, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Maybe that was in his mind when he wrote verse 7. And perhaps Jesus' words in Matthew 24 were in Peter's mind when he wrote verse 8. Remember, Jesus said, you will be hated by all nations, and the love of many will grow cold. So Peter says here in verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, at full stretch, to the very limits and more. Now that's a repeated command, isn't it, through this letter? Chapter 1, verse 22 says the same, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Chapter 3, verse 8, have brotherly love. End of chapter 5, the very last verse, greet one another with the kiss of love. Love is the answer, according to Peter. In a sense, love is all you need, but not, not the romantic sort of warm fuzz of love that the Beatles sang about in that song. Love, according to Peter, and indeed the whole Bible, is a visible and tangible thing. It's a persistent activity that shows itself, well, here in a fellowship that that smothers sin together, that shares its lives together, and that serves God together, because anything else than that isn't love at all. It's just empty talk. Look at verse 8. First of all, love is real. Love is visible and tangible, according to Peter, when it's seen in real forgiveness, in a family that smothers the gangrene of sin. Love covers a multitude of sins. And the images of a blanket, if you like, a fire blanket that both puts out the fire and then prevents the noxious, poisonous fumes from spreading their effects throughout the whole household. James uses the very same phrase in James 5, verse 20, and both he and Peter probably get it from the Proverbs. What he's speaking about, you see, is the sad reality of our lives, that the embers of sin are everywhere in the church. Wherever there are people like you and me whose natural human natures are still fallen, there are the embers of sin. And when we're under pressure, perhaps due to hostility from outside, or often in the face of hurtful behavior from one another, well, it's all too easy, isn't it, for these embers of sin to burst into flames all over again. Isn't that what happens? And when that sort of thing happens, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12 says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. An attitude of hatred, of anti-love, fans the flames, but love covers them and puts them out through forgiveness. So Paul says to the Corinthians, doesn't he, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, that anti-love in the church is arrogant, is rude, insists on its own way, is irritable, is resentful, rejoices in wrongdoing. We especially like, don't we, to rejoice in other people's wrongdoings and then to judge them for it. But love doesn't demand its own way, isn't proud or rude, doesn't rejoice at wrong, but bears all things and hopes all things and endures all things. Love smothers the gangrene of sin in the church. It quenches the fires of sin when they're stirred up, and it prevents the poisonous fumes from destroying and undermining relationships within the church. And friends, isn't that fire blanket a persistent forgiving love, one of the greatest needs in any church, at least in any church that has allowed sinners into its membership. And in case you're wondering, there are no other kinds of members in any church. Because the tensions caused by interpersonal relationships are the root of all, I repeat, all conflict in churches, always. You'll see that magnified, don't you, in small 
groups or Christian communities living very closely with one another. Perhaps, for example, in a missionary situation, ask any missionary, and they will tell you that interpersonal issues are always the greatest issues causing strife in a mission situation. Isn't that true? But it's the same in any church, wherever it is, because we're sinful. And our natural tendency is to turn to selfish behavior. Just as a compass will naturally always turn its needle to the north, unless there's a powerful magnetic force turning that needle to a different direction. And the only force that can do that in our relationships with one another is the love that issues in real persistent forgiveness. The Lord Jesus taught that very plainly, didn't he? Read Matthew chapter 18, where he's teaching his disciples about the real kingdom righteousness that must be in the church, in the community that is his people. How often am I to forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times? As many as that? Yes, said Jesus, and 70 times seven. You remember he told the parable of the unforgiving servant who had forgotten how much mercy the master had shown to him, which is why he could fail to forgive, and only why he could fail to forgive his fellow servant. Jesus' teaching and Peter's teaching is that real Christian love loves mercy. And it's visible, therefore, in tangible and real acts of forgiveness that smothers out sin at its source smothers the source of resentment and pride and anger in your heart, which will only fan the flames of further relational breakdown between individuals and then spreading to breed factions and then ultimately causing utterly destructive division in the church. Now, that is not easy, is it? It does not come naturally to us. And that's why we need to depend upon God humbly for answers to our prayers to increase our love. It's not easy, but it is essential. If we're not to be poisoned by sin's bitterness, or if we're not to allow our bitterness to spread and to poison others. It applies in our marriages, doesn't it, and in our families, where we have such great capacity to wound one another, to hurt one another and cause rift. It applies when we've been hurt by somebody in the fellowship for whatever reason, perhaps somebody slighting us or we feel not appreciating us as much as they should have. Or maybe among the young people, somebody treating us casually in a romance and casting you off and breaking your heart and then taking up with somebody else in the fellowship right in front of you. It's sad to say that too many young men disgrace themselves in that way. Not only young men, women do it too. That kind of callous behavior shouldn't have any part, should it, among believers. But you see, we hurt one another so, so easily, don't we? So many different ways. And because of that, says Peter, love must be earnest, persistent, smothering the gangrene of sin. Real love is visible and tangible when it's seen in that kind of real forgiveness. And verse 9, real persistence in love is seen in real fellowship in a family that shares the goodness of God, not grudgingly, but generously sharing lives with all our brothers and sisters, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. It's easy to share our lives meaningfully with our friends, but it's not nearly so easy to share with all our brothers and sisters in the fellowship. But you see, here's the thing. We can't choose our families, can we? We're stuck with them. And we can't choose our Christian family because God has chosen who our Christian brothers and sisters are going to be. And he says we have to share our lives with them gladly. Now, the hospitality 
Peter's speaking about probably did include showing hospitality to traveling missionaries and so on. But, but also, very clearly, it's about pitching in with resources for their own fellowship life and for their own meetings. Most of their meetings would have been in homes, especially those that had larger households and could accommodate. In other words, he's talking about sharing our material gifts from God with and for the life of our Christian fellowship. And of course, it's easy to see why some might grumble. Peter is realistic. He knows that some people would abuse that hospitality and that generosity. He knew how irksome it could be. Honestly, I wish that Andronicus would clean his clothes and wear deodorant because our whole house stinks after he's been to the meeting. You just imagine it, can't you? Well, that Demetrius eats us out of house and home. What are we going to do if he keeps coming to the church? Or a hundred other things you can imagine. And no doubt as well, it could have been very socially awkward or socially demeaning to the neighbors to have that ragtag crowd of people, some of them slaves, being seen coming in and out of your house and associating with you. And no doubt some of the people that Peter is referring to here were just thoroughly trying people in all kinds of other ways. Probably the Christians then weren't like today because we don't have trying Christians like that in the church today, do we? But I think they perhaps did then. But you see, it's a command of real love to share this way. Hebrews 13 and verse 1 says just the same, let brotherly love continue. And the very next words are these, don't neglect hospitality. It's so down to earth and practical. Because, you see, he's not just talking about the material. What he's saying is that, that material hospitality goes along with a mental attitude of sharing. People who won't open their homes to their brothers and sisters or won't open their wallets to their brothers and sisters are pretty unlikely to open their hearts to their brothers and sisters in real love. That's why in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus, when Paul is talking about Christian leaders, he says that Christian leaders are not just to have the gift of teaching. That's not enough. They're to show the grace of hospitality. Why? Well, because to share ministry in God's Word, you must be able, you must be willing also to share your life too and to share in other people's lives, both inviting them into your life and them wanting to invite you into theirs to share with them. But you see, Peter says we're, we're all called to that ministry of sharing, shared lives, to bear one another's burdens, as Paul puts it to the Galatians. And that's costly. To be involved in other people's troubles when you've got more than enough troubles of your own it takes effort and cost and investment. But that is what earnest love consists of, according to Peter. It's a fellowship of sharing our lives without grumbling, generously, not grudgingly. And inviting others into our lives and into our world, not, not shutting others out of fellowship with us, but, but opening the gates of our lives to share those lives with others. And that too can be very hard, can't it? Especially if we carry a lot of bruising, a lot of hurt from others. It can make us very fearful, can't it, of letting other people too close to us and into our lives. We want to keep people at arm's length to protect ourselves. But Peter says we mustn't do that. We must be a people who, because we are committed to the love that smothers sin, that we can be a people who are committed and who are confident in opening the doors of our lives to one another to show and to share the goodness of God with one another gladly. And then thirdly, says Peter, real earnest love is seen in real fruitfulness, in a family that serves the grace of God, verse 10 that sees God's gifts to us as for service and not for our status, that God gives us them in order to build others up, not to puff ourselves up, to feed others genuine spiritual needs, not to feed our own psychological neediness. 
Verse 10, so as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. And again, no doubt the parable that Jesus told of the wicked steward was in Peter's mind. Remember, he ignored the fact that his master was going to return, and he used his position, used his privilege, not only to serve himself, but to abuse others in the household. But Peter says it's God's very grace to be stewarded by all and for all with one another. Do you see how often that term appears? One another, one another, one another. Why? Because it's so easy and natural for us not to think of one another with our selfish hearts. It's also easy for our service within the church to look like it's for one another, but really to be just for ourselves. Somebody might be devoted to some particular thing or some area of church life, and they seem to be totally devoted. They devote hours to it, and everybody seems to think that they're slaving for others. But you see, that can quite easily just be empire building. It can quite easily just be satisfying our own need to be needed. It's not obvious, of course, until it's threatened, but when it is, then it all comes out when there's a clash of priorities. So maybe that particular group or that club is asked to move its time or its place or its prominence in order to serve the outreach and mission of the church. Perhaps a, a Christianity Explore group needs the space. Or maybe it's a music group or a choir that's asked to have a less prominent role for the sake of the preaching of the Word and the rest of the service. Or whatever other way your particular thing is challenged. And so often in a church, that's what leads to fireworks, isn't it? We know that. Or maybe it's a devoted Bible teacher, maybe in Sunday school or Bible class or with students, or perhaps it's the preacher who is seen to be slaving away. They speak wherever they can, whenever they can. They seem to be such a tireless servant of the Word. But again, that also can so easily be self-serving just serving a deep-seated psychological need to be needed, need to be appreciated, need to feel loved by others. See, when, when deep down it's that that's driving our Christian service, whatever that service is, it's so easy, isn't it, to harbor resentment, to feel unappreciated, and to feel envy and to feel jealousy whenever anyone else is praised or appreciated and seems to be more appreciated than you are. And the tragedy is when somebody feels like that, it's, it's impossible really for them ever to feel satisfied and fulfilled and loved as they want to be. Isn't there so much of that attitude in each of us by nature? I think there is. And what happens, you see, when we're like that is that we don't just resent and grumble against others. But deep in our hearts, we're resentful and grumble against God because He's ultimately to blame. We're looking to be fulfilled and He's not giving us what we want. And we become grumbly people, resentful people, unloving people. You see, Peter says that attitude is absolutely upside down. We're all stewards of God's grace, he says, verse 10, not of our own giftedness. We're serving God's household for his sake, and it's our great privilege that we're called to do that. And the honor is that we're chosen to serve him. And the dignity comes from the dignity of our master, not from the particular sphere of service that we have. Peter divides the service here into two groups in verse 11, either speaking or serving in a whole host of other ways. But either way, his point is that the privilege is that it's God's grace to each of us to be able to serve one another. If we speak, he says, it's God's Word alone that will build up the church, not our personal wisdom. However we serve, he says, it's, it's God's strength that enables it all. It's not any merit, not any personal quality that we have. None of it is about ourself, and that's so very humbling, isn't it? In fact, Peter has only one command to self in this whole passage. Verse 7, it's to control our self, to be self-controlled. Just as in verse 1, it's to arm our self 
with the thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who so loved us that he suffered for us in order to serve us so that we might serve one another likewise. That's how God was glorified in everything through Jesus Christ in his life on earth, says Peter in verse 11. And that's how God will be glorified in everything through Jesus Christ in our life as his people here on earth, in his church. As we battle conflict in the church, refusing each one of us to slip back into that selfishness in our corporate life, despite the stubbornness of that multitude of sin that we will have to deal with with one another. But we'll do that, says Peter, only if we are a church committed to the priority of prayer, to humble, prayerful dependence on God and true faith, and committed to the persistence of love, to humble, persistent interdependence on one another in love. That means together smothering the gangrene of sin in one another and ourselves and sharing the goodness of God for one another and serving the grace of God together with one another. So Peter asks us this morning in our church, are we doing that? Are we battling conflict that way? Well, we must, he says. It's our calling in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, because to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come now to this table that speaks to us of the wonder of your love to us, will you drive home to us afresh the message of your wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory himself died for us, so that our pride might be humbled and that your love, love so amazing, so divine, will indeed possess our souls, our lives, and our all, so that in everything your name will be glorified among us through Jesus, your Son. We ask this in his name. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn on the screen, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross on Which the Prince of Glory Died, My Riches Gain, I Count But Loss, and Pour Contempt on All My Pride.
The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Dearly beloved, it's right that we should uh, remember that this sacrament is a memorial of the great sacrifice of Christ for the sins of men, and therefore a true means of grace for those who believe and trust in him, and a bond and a pledge of our union with him, and of our union, therefore, with one another as brothers and sisters, as members of the body of Christ. And so it is necessary that we come with knowledge and faith, with repentance and with love, not holding fellowship with evil, not cherishing pride or self-righteousness or a spirit of unforgiveness between ourselves, but conscious of our weakness and in sorrow for our sins, humbly putting our trust in Christ and hungering and thirsting for him and seeking his grace, knowing that there is indeed a multitude of sin to be covered in our own heart and in the hearts of one another, but glad in the consciousness of his love which has covered all our sin and which therefore flows out of our hearts to one another to echo that forgiving grace. And so all who do come with humble trust and love for the Lord Jesus, and you know your own hearts. I cannot see inside your hearts or any others, and you can't see mine. But you know the truth. So those who come with humble trust with love for the Lord Jesus Christ, are welcome at his table because it's not our table but his. And it's he who invites you to it. And so all who come with humble trust, seeking his grace, seeking his mercy, knowing their sin, are welcome. Don't let anyone hinder you if that is you, not least the sense of unworthiness in your own heart. Remember the words that were said scornfully by religious people long ago of Jesus. This man eats with sinners and receives them. Yes, he does. And he still does today. And he gladly rejoices to do so. Not proud, self-righteous sinners, but penitent sinners who come seeking only his grace and none such will he ever cast out. So draw near to the holy table and hear the gracious words of our Lord Jesus himself. Come to me, he said, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. The one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, says our Lord Jesus Christ, for they shall be filled. So let's hear the words of the institution of this supper as they're given to us by the Apostle Paul. He said, I receive from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, as the Lord took bread and wine, we take also these simple elements, but set apart for this holy use of proclaiming this marvelous gospel of grace and mercy to us. And as he gave thanks and drew near the table, 
So let us also give thanks and pray as we draw near to our Heavenly Father in faith. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for the grace and the mercy that loved us earnestly at full stretch and to the last, that we might be forgiven, that by the stripes of your Son we might be healed, that our sins might be washed away as they were washed away forever on that day in history at Calvary. And so, Lord, we praise you for the message proclaimed to us by this table again and again and again. We praise you for its promise of a future that is secured, sure and certain, in the hope of the glory that we share with Jesus, your Son. We pray, Lord, that you would point us to that secure and marvelous future today as we eat this bread and drink this cup. But we pray also, Lord, that you would assure us in the present of your promise to be with us now and always, never to leave us or forsake us until the very end of the age. May we be conscious of your Spirit's presence, lifting us up, as it were, into heaven itself as we see tangibly, visibly, wonderfully in the bread and in the wine the truth of your glorious grace to us in the gospel of Christ. And so may our hearts, feeding on this by faith, be strengthened and assured, renewed, and given fresh courage for the fight, that we might leave this place more full of your love and more full of your joy for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so then, according to the institution and the example and the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, we now do this. On the same night in which he was crucified, took bread and broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. And so as the servers come now and serve you with the bread, please do take the bread and eat. And then if you would hold the cups when you're served, we'll drink together once we've been all served upstairs and downstairs. And we shall drink together in communion together. Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood, which is shed for you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, says Jesus. Let's drink together in fellowship of communion. And so may indeed the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be among us. We're going to end by singing together number 586. Number 586. Let love be found among us, a love from God alone. 
the hallmark of the children whom God delights to own. We claim that God has called us no idle boast or fraud if love directs our actions and proves we know the Lord. Number 586. And so let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.